uh, you know, I feel like, you know, you should have your cameras on out of respect for me, it's re respect for the team. And the other person says, I don't need to have my cameras on. I've got Zoom fatigue. And if there's no clear expectation and we don't have established norms around that, we, we're in conflict. It's time to pivot in your confidence, career, and compensation with the 5-Minute Career Hack Podcast every Monday and Thursday. Now, get ready for a special interview curated just for you. Welcome back to the 5-Minute Career Hack Podcast. We want to thank you for all the amazing comments and reviews that we've received. It feels absolutely amazing, and it helps us to continue to bring amazing career hacks and guests to the podcast like we have today. But before we get into the interview today, if you're new here, welcome and go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button so you're the first to know when we release a new episode. Now, let's jump into the amazing guests we have today. Karen Hurt and David Dye help human-centered leaders find clarity and uncertainty, drive innovation, and achieve breakthrough results. As CEO and president of Let's Grow Leaders, they are known for practical tools, highly interactive keynotes, and leadership development programs that stick. They've worked with leaders on every continent except for Antarctica. Through their leadership development programs, executive strategic planning, and keynote presentations, they are the award-winning authors of five books, and you know we love the number five, including Courageous Cultures, How to Build Teams of Micro Innovators, Problem Solvers, and Customer Advocates. Let's welcome Karen and David to the podcast. How are you all doing today? Oh, we're fantastic. Thanks so much for having us. Awesome. Such and a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You guys have an incredible book coming out, and we're excited to talk to you about it. But before we dive into some of the specifics of that and the work and the research that went into it, I would love for our audience to know more about your journey, which honestly inspires me and fascinates me all at the same time. So tell us a little bit about how you met, how you became partners in life and in business. So uh, David and I were both blogging uh, in the leadership development space, and we had gotten to know each other. So online, but not the swipe right, swipe left kind of online, right? And right. we were aware of each other, ran into each other at a book publishing lab. We were both getting ready to, to first traditionally published book, and we realized that we were pretty much writing the same book. And we thought, well, should we compete? <laughs> because we had a lot of the you know, same kinds of messages, or should we collaborate? So we decided to write the book together, R wrote the whole book while he was living in Colorado, I was living in Maryland. And then you know, we become really, really good friends because if you want to become really good friends with someone, you should write a book together. And realized at the end of that, we're getting ready to start the book promotion stuff, realized we had fallen in love. So. We got married, merged our businesses together, and here we are. Oh, that's phenomenal. And I think if everybody was paying close attention, Karen just gave us some dating advice. If you're looking, <laughs> write a book together. If you're looking to find your match made in heaven, write a book together. That's phenomenal. Do you want to add any pieces that she may have missed, David? Uh, the only thing I will add to that, I have a friend who's a writer as well, and he would footnote that statement and say, you will find out if you're compatible or not. You'll either love the person or not so much at the end of writing a book together. <laughs> That's absolutely a great caveat to that statement, but incredible journey. You're, you're giving hope to some of us single individuals that are in business, entrepreneurs, and as to how they might find love in a different avenue. So that's incredible. And how long have you guys been married and in business together? Uh, going on seven years here seven years. Well, congratulations. And let's dive into the research. So you guys did a survey internationally, 5,000 plus people. I would love for everyone to know in preparation for this book, I'd love for everyone to know what went into it. Why, why did you take that approach? And what were you trying to learn and gain from that survey? David, do you want to take that one? Sure. So our publisher came to us uh, and said, uh, you know, HarperCollins, and we've written several books with them, that they came and said, hey, we have identified this need in the marketplace uh, regarding conflict. And so they asked us if we'd be interested in writing the book about it. They thought that our approach and our experience in the workplace and around the world with our clients and leaders and teams would be helpful. And so we said yes. But then as we looked at each other and thought about it, you know, there's our thoughts, but we really wanted to know what was happening in the workplace with regard to conflict right now. 
because after the pandemic, that certainly has changed things. And so we wanted to know. So that's why we decided to do the survey. And so we uh, surveyed over 5,000 people in 46 different countries around the world, um, asking them questions that like, are, what level of conflict, are they experiencing more or less conflict in the workplace? What are the effects of that conflict? Why are they experiencing the more or less? Uh, and then we asked them to tell us about a significant conflict that they've had in their career, what happened, so on. And then uh, one of the fun questions for us was, if you could go back and give yourself advice, what advice would you give yourself about that conflict if you had to do it again? So uh, that's the nature of the research and why we decided to do it. Okay. So over 5,000 plus people worldwide, right? Worldwide, which is incredible because that definitely helps the sample size. And what were some of your biggest highlights? For me, there was a bucket, but I want to hear from you first. There was a big <laughs> highlight for me that I almost want to ask a question about the research to see if there was some overlap. But I'd love to hear from you all, like each of you, one thing that really just surprised you. Yeah. So one of the big, big things was the, if you talk about the advice to former self, more than half of the respondents said, I would be more patient and stay calm. And that is so consistent with other conflict research, right? That because when you are in a deep, when you're in deep stress mode, right? Yeah, that is not where you are at your best self for communicating and choosing the right words and doing those things. So, so many people said, hey, I, I would just chill out for a moment before I address the conflict. And then the, the other piece of it was 21% said that um, they would speak up and address the conflict sooner. They wouldn't let it linger so long. And both of those are very telling because so many people also anecdotally told us they just were avoiding the conflict. And that no, no conflict gets better by turning the other way. Yeah, nothing gets better, period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And David? Yeah, for me, uh, one of the interesting findings. So, you know, when we ask about are you experiencing more or less conflict uh, today, 70% uh, of people said they're experiencing the same or more conflict, which I think anecdotally you're like, yeah, I kind of feel that. But the interesting piece for me was in that 30% who said, I'm experiencing less conflict at work. And well, when we dig in and say, why, half of those people who say I'm experiencing less, the reason they're experiencing less is they change jobs or they're working from home. And so they're not around people and so they're like, I'm not having conflict because I'm not around anybody to have conflict with. And so they escaped. It's not necessarily productive growth or that their workplace is better. And for those working from home who are just experiencing less interaction overall, you're also missing out on all of the constructive, productive conflict that could happen for new ideas, creativity, and so on. So uh, even in the 30% of people who say, yeah, I'm, I'm having less, I'm experiencing less, there's some some reasons, half of those are not such good reasons. That's so interesting. And so then I wonder, what does that development look like moving forward for remote and hybrid workers, employees? Because to your point, they just kind of escaped it, avoid, they're avoiding it, not developing in this way. Um, and does conflict even look different in a hybrid remote setting? Which we'll get to, we'll get to. And before we get there, though, I did want to ask, the there was 27 percent of people it was 27 and 27 the burnout right. overwhelmed and understaffed is the reason that contributed it was seen mm -hmm. very pronounced in those two buckets and the other was poor management practices mm -hmm. and i wonder if if understaffed is in the other bucket which is obviously a role for management could, was there some overlap or could that also still be considered poor management yeah so the interesting thing there is we let people choose up to three uh, of those reasons for for contributing factors for conflict. And with a lot of the poor management practice, what you're finding there is people really struggling with a couple of things. One is the post-pandemic work world. Uh, the, the It's harder to find people. So you do have the staffing challenges that aren't related necessarily to management, but are just related to there just aren't as many people. Yet a lot of people leave the workforce and you've got those challenges. Then you've got uh, people trying to figure out how to deal with this remote hybrid environment and what that should look like and uh, workforce wanting one thing and, and some management wanting another and the managers caught in between all of that going, oh my goodness, what do I do? 
And then you've got, there's a lot of research uh, around the increasing complexity of today's workplace. So uh, scattered across time zones as people went more remote. So now you've got more hire from anywhere. Well, that it brings with it all sorts of management challenges about how do you bring a team together across time zones when they can't see each other, when they're, they're not having those interactions. And people are very much still learning how to lead through all of that. So you see uh, Gallup data around managers are for the first time more disengaged than even the employees they're leading because of some of those challenges. And then there's also increased expectation from workers for empathy and compassion and concern, and which are good things. And you have a lot of managers really working through how do we do all this? So that's where some of that intersection comes from. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they got to select three and you're 200% correct that this is a new uncharted territory for the world and the workplace um, being hybrid and remote and then we're hybrid, but then we're not, then we're remote and then we pull it back. And then we, that whole yep. back and forth thing that's gone on for a little while. You had something yeah. you wanted to add, Karen? Yeah. I, th- I mean, cause I think part of what we, we really saw in the anecdotal uh, comments was a lack of clarity of expectations. So there is conflict because, well, if I say you can work from anywhere, well, where is anywhere? Is it, can you work from the petting zoo with your ki- your toddler running around? Right. Right. That's real a real example. story. Uh, if I say <laughs> I want you to, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, you should have your cameras on out of respect for me, it's re- respect for the team. And the other person says, I don't need to have my cameras on. I've got Zoom fatigue. And if there's no clear expectation and we don't have established norms around that, we, we're in conflict. And so part of it is ha- slowing down and have managers really slow down to say, what does success look like in this new hybrid world? And then the other real example that just came up, we were working with a global team and they were trying to come find a way for us to come and do a remote training for everyone because they were scattered all over the world. You had people in Asia, you had people in Las Vegas, there was only one hour of the day that was even remotely reasonable and that for them to all get together. And that was still with having people log in at 9 p.m. at night for some of them. You know, that's hard to lead wow. in, in an environment. And, you know, that's just trying to pull together training. But how do they even have any other kinds of meetings? It, it makes it very, very difficult to build those relationships. So a big chunk of it is this new workplace well, I hate to say post COVID because it's still there, but post the height of COVID yeah. and the pandemic. So there is that, that's probably putting more pressure on conflict in the workplace than anything else at this point. As as far as why you might be seeing the uptick, is that is that a fair conclusion? You know, there's that, we, you know, we call it a conflict cocktail, right? There's so many different things that are happening. So you've got that. Uh, all of the shift to new ways of working that where expectations are not necessarily clear. You also have people are feeling isolated. You know, the, the pandemic is not that far in our rear view mirror. And just a couple of years ago, we were all choosing our bubble and who was safe and who was not safe. And then in the middle of all that, you have all this social unrest, right? That uh, for huge, yes. really firing up. And then you've got social media and people are taking sides on social media. So you've got all of this anxiety that's coming from the so the environment that we're, we're working in. And at the same time, we're lonely. And so like, I'm, I feel distant from you, but I'm also lonely. Right. And so I think that also is, is making people um, feel more on edge too. Yeah. And I think it's very interesting. You guys had a, a section in the earlier part of the book around the negative bias specific to social media. If you could guys take, I think that's such an important factor. I'm actually ha- going to have that conversation this week as part of one of my leadership conversations with my players, right? Because they're 100% native to social media. They grew up with a phone in their hand on social media at the age that yeah. they're at, right? And I think it's so important that under, even though they're not getting off social media, understanding that this this negative bias exists, which I'd love for you to talk about, is is a huge part of the conflict and why they struggle to deal with conflict, whether that's in the classroom, playing with friends, what have you. So I'd love for you all to talk about that a little bit since you mentioned social media. Yeah, definitely. The 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 and we really saw this over the years of the pandemic. I think we got heightened awareness of it. Is that 
so many of the ways that social media is designed is to ultimately to sell advertising, which means we need the, the social media companies need to keep us on their platforms. And the easiest ways to do that, and it's hyper engineered to do that, is to trigger our our lizard brain, right? That that part of us that's easily with curiosity, with the intrigue when it's good, but so often with fear, with enraging things, with, oh, that upsets me. And now I've got to and so, you know, there's this saying, if it enrages, it engages, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, uh, and so when you're in an environment like that and you're spending time, you get a distorted sense of what reality is. So even if you just look at headlines, like go through the news and I read the news every morning, but as I do, I'm looking at the headlines going, if you just look at those headlines, they create this story of what's happening in your life and in your world that is violent and scary and out of sorts and enraging and the 10 things you've got to know or you're stupid or these people are dumb or you know all these kinds of things and it's like oh my goodness so you get this cacophony of violence stress fear coming at you all the time it affects how you think and how you engage and ultimately and it's a it's a simplistic and unrealistic view but that colors how you're going to engage with conflict with other people and the, you said it's simplistic, but I think how we're how our brains are wired, if we can understand that and where we default to, primarily because, you know, it's designed to protect us, right? So that's why we default to it, right? Because we've got to anticipate bad outcomes to avoid those outcomes, mm -hmm. right? And so then they're using that very thing on social media to keep us engaged, right? Yes. So what was initially, in my opinion, designed to take care of us, to help protect us and preserve our species is now being used, right, to keep us engaged. But then it has this incredible impact on how we interact with people and would love to hear uh, just a little bit more about if, if you saw any of that in the research as far as some of the things that people shared. Did it have a more negative connotation or was there a lot of ownership even in the survey? I'm just curious. You know, it's interesting because, you know, we also went deep and did a bunch of interviews in addition to the survey. And we have an example from uh, Riverside Health Systems, which is really, uh, I actually got an opportunity to go down and do some work with them, uh, one of their conferences, very human centered, like really good, good culture. Well, they had employees on social media uh, when all the riots were happening and you can imagine a hospital system is already under so much stress in the pandemic. And then they had their employees and some of them were saying hateful things and it was creating un unre additional unrest. And they took a bold stand, which I don't think every organization is prepared to do. And they said, no, you, we, we wouldn't let you talk like that in our workplace. And we're, and if you, you, you need to take down that you are an employee at Riverside Health System. If you are going to, on your platform, like don't say that on LinkedIn and then let them see that you work for us. And they went one by one to every individual who they were seeing this surface with. Everybody but one apologized, did not realize the impact that it was having on the brand and took, it, took down the post. And one person refused to and quit. Wow, And that's a courageous move, right? That is a courageous that's move from, the, from an employer. But they're saying these are our values, right? And if this is, this is inconsistent with our values and we're going to take a stand on it. And so I think that's the kind of thing, you know, we think that, well, that's their personal. We can't say anything about their personal, but it does, people are connected and, you know, you come to work and you're working beside as a nurse, another nurse who has said something that is, you know, offensive to you. And so I think that's the kind of challenging conflict that is, is getting created with social media that we weren't dealing with 10 years ago. I definitely, definitely saw a few instances to your point where companies uh, got really bold. And if someone did something, even where they were caught on video mistreating someone or talking in a derogatory manner towards someone. And, and the ones that stick out, obviously, to me being a black woman were the ones when someone was treating a black person poorly. And right. they, there was a few instances, probably not enough, but there was a few instances where they terminated that person mm -hmm. um, from, from employment based upon, I, I guess that would fall under the bucket of their character and behavior. Um, 
And it was it was interesting because you'd never seen that before. Yeah. Ne- I've, you know, I've been discriminated against in 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 the retail space as a shop, as a customer, as a shopper. And, you know, nothing, n- nothing's happening. Right. <laughs> nothing's right. going to happen to that person. But I think it's very interesting that there's a there's a, enough of those instances where people were held accountable by losing their job. And that was driven by social media. Mm-hmm. So I think that part of it also is very intriguing because the very thing that keeps us engaged, because that some of those stories kept me engaged, mm-hmm. right? From a negative bias standpoint, but were also important to rectifying a situation and also keeping someone from ruining your brand. It yeah. makes me think about the incident at Starbucks. I guess that's probably been a couple of years ago where they had to kind of shut down and Yep. Doing some intensive training as yeah. a result of someone mistreating someone. So I think it's very interesting because it's like social media is not going away and there's benefits. And then, but then there's this thing that we have to own to help ourselves is what I hear you guys focusing on throughout this book and just understanding how our brains work, understanding yeah. how we're being messaged to, and then what we can do about that to kind of maintain a level of control of our reaction. So I think yeah. the work, the research is absolutely phenomenal. And I am I literally thoroughly enjoyed the book. And everybody listening, this is a book that I know it's designed around the workplace, but it could absolutely help you inside of your family unit, inside your own personal relationships. And I'd love for you to share with those that are listening that might not be thinking from the workplace how this could impact them personally as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say the uh, one thing we should mention is that uh, all of this research that we're talking about is uh, the grounding for the book is called uh, Powerful Phrases for Dealing with Workplace Conflict. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right, is the workplace conflict uh, is just one element of our personal conflict, right? We can have it in a lot of different ways. And uh, the we identified four dimensions of conflict that you can invest in up front to minimize the negative effects of conflict. And as you invest them in the middle of conflict, they'll also to help lessen that intensity and move to a, a more collaboration and constructive um, approach. So I'll preview that there's those four dimensions there and they do cross from workplace to, to personal. And Karen, what were you going to say? Well, yeah, I was going to go there too. And they, I think the, you know, like, so for what example, one of the dimensions is connection. And so the more connected I feel with you, before we are in a conflict, right? The more I, I know who you are, that I think you have my best interest heart, heart, that we trust one another, we have some history together. Then when something goes wrong, and I think you've done something wonky, you know, so then like, oh, well, gosh, did she just steal credit for my idea? Well, if I have all this deep trust and, you know, by the way, yet last week you stood up for me in a meeting and you really have my back and now... I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I'm going to come to you and say, hey, right. I'm curious, what's what's going on here? That, that didn't feel so good to me, right? But if if there's a we don't know each other, and I think you stole my idea, I may just stew on it for a month before I even give you the opportunity to talk about it. And it still may have been an innocent mistake, right? right? And so I think that creating that connection before you need it is certainly important. And then how do you create connection and ground your any conversation you're going to have in connection. So we have these goats, uh, greatest of all, which you'll love, right? <laughs> uh, greatest of all time, yes. uh, powerful phrases. And we have uh, three for each one of the four dimensions. Well, so the connection one, you know, we say, you know, start a conversation like this, grounding in your intention. I really care about you and our work together. And I'm confident we can find a solution here we can both work with. That is, a, you know, that is a, creating a connection as opposed to starting the conversation. Why did you do that? Right. Or what Automatically putting them on the defense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. So the four dimensions, if you could repeat those four dimensions for the audience. So yeah. we, as we get into kind of the structure of the book, which I think is extremely important and I love. So share those four dimensions again. Okay. So it starts with connect, this connection. And that is, you know, are we connected as human beings? And then there's clarity. Do we have a shared understanding of success? Okay. And then curiosity. And this is the, this is, uh, you know, curiosity from about other people's perspectives and curiosity about what's possible. 
And then commitment, which is um, how are you going to move forward? Because one of the, the challenges that we often see in conflicts is we'll have a conflict, but we don't schedule what's going to happen next, or we don't get specific. Like, okay, so we got to really, you know, we've got to do better when we're in these emotionally charged situations. Don't you agree? Yeah, we should stop using F bombs. Okay. Right. But we don't say, hey, let's, let's, let it, these are let's the check in we're going to do and let's check it in a month and see if we're doing any better. So if the problem continues, now you got to get all that courage again to start the conversation. So the whole commitment is all about how do you really make it clear about what the next steps are? That's such a good point. And uh, even as a kid, myself personally, I didn't like getting in trouble. I'm a rule follower, right? So I didn't like getting in trouble. So if I knew the rules, cool, I'm going to just do what I need to do, right? And I hate, I absolutely hate having to do something over again. So for <laughs> anyone that's out there like that, the advice that you just gave around having to build and muster up the courage to start this process all over again is not worth it. Trust me. I mean, I'm getting anxiety thinking about having to do it. And I don't want to do that. Let's just get it out of the way now and set some structure moving forward around how we check in and make sure we're still good, which again, great in personal relationships as well, right? Probably as well with kids. If your parents out there, it's probably very important uh, from, from a behavior standpoint, if you're correcting a behavior. Yeah. You know, it's also interesting when you take this into your personal life. One of the things that we have really noticed doing this kind of work across a variety of industries all over, all, all over the world, different cultures, is that the closer you are as a human, this is the irony of the connection. Sometimes that when you're in the deepest, most personal relationships, that's when we get the clumsiest about using the right words. Right. So for example, all right, David and I are married. We collaborate on everything, right? We're building all our curriculum together. We, it's, uh, there's a lot of potential conflict because we're, we're working together so closely and we have very different views of how we approach things. Well, I would never say to this to somebody else on my team, but somebody brought a, us a, an idea. I would never say, yeah, that's a, that's a terrible idea. But I have said it to David. Right. You know, and it, because we take shortcuts and that's, mm. and, we, and that does destruct, does destruction to relationships. And we see that at executive teams all the time. And so, you know, the CEO will say to the CEO, oh, that's a terrible idea or that'll never work. And everybody else sitting around the table who he probably wouldn't have said that to heard it. And in, they're in shock at that point that it even, <laughs> I've been in those situations in corporate America. I've been in those situations and we're like, whoa, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not going to raise my idea because look what just happened to that guy. Right. Got destroyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's such a good point. And, and I love the way you said that because I was thinking about personal relationships and workplace relationships. And the word you use was taking shortcuts um, in those relationships. And that's affected. That's effectively what you're doing. And to the detriment of that relationship and getting to a place where you can remain collaborative. Yes. And, because uh, I don't know how much I can take of that all the time. Right. I'm still human. I'm tough, but I'm human. Of you continually to shut me down in that manner before I'm like, okay, enough is right. enough yeah. of that. Right. Yeah. So I think that's incredible. Join us next Monday for part two of powerful phrases for dealing with workplace conflict with Karen Hurt and David Dye. I truly hope you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed doing it for you. However, it doesn't have to end there. Come on over to our Facebook group community right now for free. You're going to get exclusive content that we weren't able to include in this episode as well as past episodes. We've got challenges. We've got research. We've got lives. You name it all for you in bite-sized chunks so that you can continue this development journey. Go ahead, click the link right now in the description show notes, and we'll see you there.